Welcome to episode three in March, when I strengthen my habit to resolve any conflicts that might be in my life. March's habit is to resolve conflicts. March's color is peaceful dove gray. Our goal for the month is to patch up a relationship with at least one person. This is your personal invitation to get off the battlefield of conflict and onto the playing field of collaboration. March comes in like a lion, goes out like a lamb. So what better month to get off the battlefield? Resolve conflicts doesn't mean pretend that they don't exist. It means coming together at the heart to look at the source of the conflict together. That's getting off the battlefield. Now you're ready for a new playing field, intentional mutual benefit. So even if you disagree on certain beliefs, you can minimize that dissonance by amplifying your resonance. And from there, you can get to the heart of the matter, which is the matter of the heart. Hi, I'm Steve Behrman and welcome to March, the third month of the year, where we focus on resolving conflicts in our lives. Like the month of March itself, it, we, if we come into March with a few lions we're coping with, let's take the initiative to turn them into lambs, to kind of soften them and make them a, a little more warm and fuzzy, right? So look for the lines of conflict uh, and even the anger that you find uh, in your life now. Is there anybody who you're on the outs with? You're on the outs with yourself. Who is it that you're not getting along with? Knowing that uh, in, these, in this age that's coming, harmony is gonna prevail. Well, that doesn't reduce the stress of being in the present time with the interpersonal strife and issues that we have today. Remember, the goal of March is to patch up a relationship with at least one person. So as we learned in our introductory episode to the 12 habits, as a path for mutual enlightenment, this path is a new way to actually put our desire for unity and intentional evolution into real monthly regular practices. We can grow spiritually while at the same time we are practically using these uh, habits to make our lives and the lives around us better. What uh, Bruce Lipton would call heaven on earth, uh, this is what we can achieve by doing this, and this is why he endorses the 12 habits practice. Heaven is not a destination, it's a practice. We bring it to the world with our actions. Okay, now these habits I have found are the best way, uh, and most fun way, and the most enjoyable uh, way to bring evolution into practice on a daily basis, particularly when we're all doing the same practice, same month together. So now I'd like to introduce my cohort in this webinar, the creator of the 12 Habit Path to Intentional Evolution, Elaine Park. Welcome, Elaine. Hey, Steve, it's nice to be here with you during the month of March, celebrating Resolve Conflicts, very important habit in the 12 Habits of Unity. And thank you for talking with me about this today. You know, a key part of experiencing unity is recognizing what it means when we're disconnected from others. And we call it getting off the old battlefield and onto a new playing field. Battlefield is on the turf of separation. The playing field is where we come together above and beyond our conflicts to work together, play together and create a better world. Now, I'm curious, how did you and your people come up with March as the month to resolve conflicts? Well, you sort of hinted at one of the main reasons uh, in your earlier introduction of the month, and that is uh, March is the month to resolve conflicts, and March is well known as the month that comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. So when the community uh, crowdsourcing group, we'll say, who originally went through the year and tried to decide, you know, which month should we use for what, for what quality. And these are basically ancient qualities of wisdom about how to lead a happy life. Um, March just seemed the natural month for resolved conflicts. Interestingly, 30 years ago when this was going on, uh, the fact that St. Patrick's Day was in March and the conflict ongoing, long ongoing conflict in Ireland was still much more resonant. Right now, you know, Ireland is 
doing very well and it's no longer a major, um, you know, the conflict in Ireland is no longer a major conflict well known in the world. There are some other difficult conflicts going on, but not that one. So it comes in like a lion and out like a lamb. And so why not do it in your relationships? And that's why we picked March. Funny that you mentioned Ireland, because even though these days there doesn't seem to be that much ire in Ireland, there's a lot of ire in other places in the world. And, you know, as, as we think about this, um, we've been living in this uh, illusion of separation that seems like reality to us. And so this seems and feels like, quote unquote, a normal thing uh, when we are, uh, when we're, these conflicts seem normal. And of course, you know, there's always going to be disagreements between people. We're never all going to agree. That would be a terrible world if we all agreed. But it's really very important to recognize how it is that we get uh, involved in these polarizations and these, uh, these battlefield fights. Uh, and it has a lot to do with um, being right. It has a lot to do with being right. Uh, my wife Trudy and I figured this out uh, several years ago that whenever uh, an argument comes up, the, the game that we play to kind of remind us to be funny about it, um, one of us who has the realization first said, let's get off the battlefield. And the other one says, but, but I wasn't done being right yet. So if we start to recognize, um, do we want to be right or do we want to be happy? What is it in our lives that needs resolution, resolving conflict, resolution. Healing means restoring wholeness. What is required to um, restore wholeness in our lives? You know, now sometimes people are, are conflict verse, right? What if people don't want to deal with conflict at all? I want to pretend it doesn't exist. Well, I'm actually a conflict adverse person myself. I think with the amount of adversity I endured during the early years of my childhood, um, I found in your sense that uh, that anger and being around conflict and anger and raging people is probably the most the most stressful experience I can have. I'm actually I've actually encountered some pretty what other people might consider stressful. Um, physical experiences, you know, challenges, but really ang angry, raging people scares me more than anything else. So I am absolutely convict conflict adverse. And one of the things that I want to make a point that this is not uh, always get along. The, the habit for this month isn't, isn't always get along because always get along is in fact not realistic. Nothing would ever grow. Nothing would ever change. It's the, it's the beauty of the interchange between people and different viewpoints uh, coming together that often, uh, that often creates a break into a future development in, in privately, personally, in a marriage relationship like yours, um, in a community in a country so that it's the it's the way of resolving conflicts in a healthy way that matters. I'm actually a, um, a certified peer mediation leader and there's a you know there's a process that you go through when you when you do peer mediation. So whoever the mediator is, you know the first thing to do is to get the two people with different perspectives on something who are probably fighting, you know, to state what their position is. And so the role of the peer mediator is to step by step get the one person on one side after they told their stories say, well, what about the, the other person's point of view could you agree with? And, you know, it's just a back and forth, very nice orderly path for getting two people on opposite sides of an argument to, to gradually come together and arrive at a conclusion that both of them can live with. It's just a really nice part of what I do. 
Yes, part of that is rehumanizing the other that's been dehumanized through the conflict. You know, in, in these times when so much of our uh, information and very sadly our consciousness is influenced by things going on out there, particularly the narratives that we're told in, uh, in our media that tends to polarize and other, other people and create enemies. And uh, one of the things that happened, you know, when, when I first became acquainted with the, uh, with, with the 12 powers, um, it, it happened to be March. <laughs> and uh, it so happened that I had a couple of people in my life who I was in conflict with. And this had to do with uh, differing views on, uh, on politics and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, both of these people had kind of canceled me. And um, I was getting toward the end of March. And I said, well, you know, March is a resolve conflicts month. What the heaven? I'll give it a try. And I reached out to both of these people. And I reached out pretty much in the way that you're talking about. And I said, you know, I understand that we disagree about this, but we have a foundation and friendship. Why don't we build on what we resonate with, this resonance and friendship, and then let the dissonance handle itself. And miraculously, both of these relationships were healed. And one of them, uh, I'm on a call with this individual every week. We're working on a project together. Uh, the other one I'm helping with an event uh, that they're doing uh, next month. And so all of this came as a result of my resolve to resolve conflict. Now, sometimes these conflicts are not happening in present time. There are things that happened in the past that are impacting us in the present. And I know, Elaine, that you had an experience um, uh, with with your mom. I hope you, you don't mind sharing that experience. I've made it clear that uh, a lot of my life trajectory came out of an abusive childhood that primarily had to do with my mother. But <laughs> so as life went on, you know, I married and had children. I have two lovely sons and I had a, lots of friends. Uh, one of them was a very close friend who actually was able to be honest with me enough to say, you know, Elaine, the only, re the only time I can't stand you is when you go off on your mother. <laughs> Whoa, wow. <laughs> that really, that really got to me. And then I realized, you know, that, that I was still being injured. You know, the, the injury of my childhood had ended but I was carrying that injury with me every day in the anger that I carried toward my mother. My mother wasn't around. And so I found a book called Making Peace with Your Parents. So I'm, I am definitely um, endorsing that book. I probably still on the market because it's so good. And basically this book explained that if it's possible, you should go, you need, there's a transition between a parent-child relationship where the child is a child, and then an apparent relationship where both parties are adults. And one of the keys to it is as the now adult child to learn who your parents are as people. You know, we've only known them as our parents. And so therefore they don't have a persona beyond their effect on us. It's the one, re if we don't grow up and become an adult child, able to see our parents as whole people with things that affected them, um, then, you know, you're still in an infantile, infantile child-adult relationship. So I went and visited my parents for quite a while, about a week, I think. And during that time, if I followed the guidance of the book, I emptied myself of myself. And I spent the whole week asking my parents questions about them as people, things that I never had thought uh, I mean, there are questions that I would ask a friend I was getting to know within the first few days of knowing them. But there are questions that I'd never asked, I'd never thought of asking my parents. I'd never thought of getting to know my parents as people. So the week went on that way and it was just a lovely week. And toward the end of the week, I went out to lunch with my mother and she revealed to me a tragic, experience from her childhood which gave me the clue of why and how she had carried 
the deep rage in her all her life that had exploded on me as a child. So as the years went on, um, we became close again. My mother's not necessarily an intimate kind of a person. And I visit her frequently toward the end of her life. I was there with her at the end of her life. And now as an adult with my parents pass, passed on, I have none of that rage because I healed the relationship with my parents through that effort, that small effort in the greater scheme of things. And I'm the one that was healed. And I will always appreciate the fact that I did that. And the friend who was honest enough with me to tell me that she didn't like it when I went off on my parents. Wow, that was a great story. Uh, it reminds me of a, of a quote from Ramdas who said, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your parents. Because it's likely to bring that back up. Now, I know many people, um, I know perhaps all of us, I, I'm reminded of that cartoon I saw many years ago. Uh, there's this huge auditorium and there's a banner up in front on the, that says, children of functional parents, a huge empty auditorium, but there's three or four people sitting in the audience. So <laughs> <laughs> we understand that a lot of us have this history. Well, my parents have been gone since the 1970s. And so uh, there are two uh, great teachers of forgiveness, uh, who I found. Uh, one of them is uh, Leonard Laskow, Dr. Leonard Laskow, who wrote a book called Healing with Love. And his other book is called Forgiving Love. And one of the, uh, he makes several important points about forgiveness. And by the way, forgiveness is what we do to, uh, what you did was a form of forgiveness because you went back to the past, you actually allowed that experience to be there the perspective that you gain from your mother's experience and her uh, intimately sharing what it was that helped create that uh, that personality issue that she had you had um, there was a mutual understanding and then there was a sense of release so forgiveness is releasing the past so the person doesn't have to be present for you to forgive it's an it's an individual process that we each can do by ourselves Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting, but the memory is transferred from the amygdala part of the brain where we hold all of these strong emotional uh, attachments and so on to the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain where we simply remember the incident without incident, so to speak. So uh, you don't have to, uh, first of all, the person doesn't have to be present. If you're forgiving them, they could be off planet. Uh, second of all, um, you're not forgetting by forgiving. You're not going into denial. And third of all, forgiving doesn't condone what happened. It simply allows you to become aware of what happened, allows you to acknowledge what happened, allows you to accept what happened, and then create a sense of completion so that uh, the balance is restored. Uh, the other great teacher of forgiveness is a, a wonderful woman, uh, named Celeste Iacoboni. And she has been working with the Hawaiian practice of Ho'oponopono, which means making the right right. And she developed this uh, from the Ho'oponopono uh, um, practice. She developed a musical chant that, uh, I'm sorry, I love you. Please forgive me. I thank you. And whenever my wife Trudy and I have any kind of conflict or kerfuffle, we look at each other, we look each other in the eye and we express this mantra of forgiveness. And that's something that releases the, uh, what it, it, it melts, you know, when you're looking in somebody's eyes and you know sincerely they are looking to, complete, to, to create wholeness, it melts any desire to be right or get even or anything like that. And, uh, I, you had something with your mother, uh, something occurred with me and my mother about four years ago. My mother was, was kind of a difficult person and I realized that as a child and as a teenager and as a young adult, I simply rejected her love. Um, I simply blocked it off. And uh, a few years ago, I'm, I forgot what it was that triggered this experience. I went, I was the one who blocked off my mother's love. 
the love was there, I just shut it down for my own reasons. And so, you know, doing various internal processes, I was able to access um, my mother, her energy. And I created a forgiveness process with her that changed my life. The first thing I realized is that I could feel her presence and there was so much joy and relief in knowing that her love was accepted by me. Very, very important. Well, now for the last several years, I've had the resource of my mother's love. I know it's there. She doesn't have to be present. I can feel it. And when I do meditation, sometimes I feel her presence. Uh, there was something that happened a, a few years ago where Trudy and I had a, a big fight and I walked out and went for a walk. That's what I, you know, you know, work it off. And I didn't know what to do. And so in my, in my walk, I, I just asked my mom, what should I do? My mom gave me the exact words. She said, tell her this, do this and tell her this. So I walked back up there. I did what my mom said. I'm not even remembering what it was. I did exactly what she said. And it just totally resolved the conflict that we had. Totally resolved it. And it was an amazing healing. And anyone can do this. So if you're looking at the, uh, you know, the people in your life, or even yourself, what is it that you haven't forgiven yourself for, right? So this is the practice for March. If we're resolving conflicts, you know, let's go all the way back to these things that may have happened a long time ago that are still impacting our lives now. Is there a way we can create completion, uh, ho'oponopono, um, and resolution right now so those things don't have the negative influence that they've had? That's an amazing story, Steve. And now that your mother is, your mother's spirit is in your life now, giving you positive guidance, perhaps more than ever before. And that's just a beautiful thing when you have forgiveness and that's open to you. You know, in the path of the 12 habits, this being the month to resolve conflicts, um, the whole idea of being a peer participant in this and being part of it is that we, or that the habits, or the taking a few minutes out of a day to meditate, you know, I forgive myself, I ponder my, my ability to resolve conflicts in my life as a meditation, that you, for instance, when you met me, you know, you, you probably were thinking, you know, these 12 habits things, I don't know about that. And then, you know, one day it was March and you thought to yourself, you know, I'll try this out. And sure enough, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer this in a few minutes, but, you know, do you think you would have done that if you hadn't already had some influence of the messaging resolve fun conflicts during the month of March going on with your life. In the schools and communities where we've worked, um, there are just a couple of cute stories of things that really happened. Again, I tell our peer participants here who are listening to us, you know, I feel like I've just had all these fabulous experiences because I personally have experienced so many people's lives being transitioned because they've heard the messaging for the month and really done something about it. In one of the schools, uh, they wanted to have a monthly assembly on um, on resolved conflicts. And one of the classes was studying um, wolves. And they read in their studies that wolves know how to get along better in their pack than people do. <laughs> so they created an assembly where they found a team of people that is allowed by the government to keep wild animals for the purpose of training and helping kids. And they actually brought, um, they actually brought uh, wolves to the school. And in the school program, they explained habitat and everything about the wolves, but they also explained that the wolves do a better job than people do of getting along. There was a senior center that was involved in the 12 habits and they were having a terrible time at the senior center with, with bickering <laughs> over, <laughs> canasta, over canasta games or whatever it was. <laughs> and so it was, it was March 
And so what did somebody do? One afternoon, one of the people, one of the seniors walked in and they had baked a cake. I've got a photo of it. I think there might be a photo of it in the book. Um, but they, they had actually baked a cake and, and written across the top of the cake was resolve conflicts. And they cut up the cake and everyone in the, everybody at the senior center got a piece of resolve conflict cake and, and the bickering went down and, you know, the, the atmosphere in the senior center got a lot better. So I really think that, that the 12 habits, if, if the peer participants who are listening to us are gradually beginning to feel convinced that they want to get into this and just with a few minutes of their time practice that habit and become part of the residence that makes a coherent an organized coherent community out of a body of out of the body of people we are here on this planet and the more of us that get involved the more likely we are to be able to solve some of these big problems because it's going to take a lot of us um, and I'm hoping that this will grow, the media will get involved and that we can really help resolve a lot of the bigger conflicts going on both in our country and around the world. I, I love the wolf story. You know, it reminds me of a couple of things. Uh, I read somewhere that children who grow up with dogs are better socialized because dogs being part of packs are always looking for cues from the others in the pack. And sometimes if you either grow up isolated or, you know, with or without any siblings, you don't really have any anchors for uh, connecting with other people and knowing how this thing works. And in a wolf pack, what's so very, very interesting is that the alpha wolf is the one who initiates play. As my, Car my friend Caroline Casey would say, who, who did have a wolf for a while, wolf, wolf, want to play. And so, part of the great benefit of resolving the conflicts of healing these things that are wounds from the past and are blocking forces in the present is that you become much more capable of play and inviting uh, uh, other people out to play. You know, sometimes uh, as, a, as a comedian, I've, I've had a lot of respect for the way that comedy can present things uh, you know, like the like the famous court jester being able to speak to the king uh, through comedy, saying things that nobody else can say. And so one of the things that Swami Beyondananda was talking about, well, ever since I started doing this back in the 1980s, was, um, you know, the, the great vision of of our achievement in the future is non-judgment day. Non-judgment day. That's when everybody wins a beauty contest. And all the lawyers disappear because our trials will be over, right? But, uh, but the whole idea about judgment, uh, so much of the conflict that we have is holding judgment against other people. That's not the same as discerning whether something is harmful for me or helpful for me, but in holding these rigid, projected judgments. And the most humbling thing I've ever learned about judgment is Whatever I'm judging in other people, I'm judging that in myself. Because you can see that, oh, I just did the very thing that I was accusing somebody else of doing. Ha, ha, ha. So through the, so in, in resolving conflicts, let's always remember the power that humor has. Self-facing humor. Not humor that insults other people, but humor where we lovingly laugh in our own face. Where we laugh in the face of our own, uh, illusion of separation, our own uh, ego uh, desires to be right. And in the process of laughing at ourselves, we're able to uh, eliminate possible conflicts with other people. One, one more story I'm reminded of. Abraham Lincoln was a perfect example of somebody who used humor to uh, uh, soften things around the edges. And he was involved in a, in a debate and his opponent called him two-faced. And he said, now if I had two faces, would I be using this one? <laughs> and so one of the ways to break the trans of separation is through the unity of laughter in the heart. That's very powerful, okay? So Elaine, is there anything else that you wanna share about resolving conflicts 
before we uh, talk about how they can participate this month? Well, first of all, I love the, I love, I didn't know that story about Abraham Lincoln, but you know, that was just, what, what a great answer. I think if we look, you know, we're, we, it, we know that we are part of a much larger body. And uh, Bruce Lipton talks a lot about, about how our body has, I don't know how many trillion cells. We all, our, our body, my body has my DNA, your body has your DNA. And that basically, I think it helps in practicing resolve confidence in our own life to realize that our own body is a community. It's a community of cells that are being, that are making the heart work. It's a community of cells that are making the brain work, the liver, the kidney, you know, all the parts of our body is basically a community, one community. And so it has to work together. We live because all the cells in our community work together. And, you know, we don't blow up or, I mean, things, break down or whatever, but then a community of people with another DNA, a doctor or a nurse or uh, a practitioner or someone that knows ancient herb formulas, you know, it helps bring our body back into healing practice. But I think waking up in the morning and, and sort of thanking the parts of your body and thinking of your body as a community and then thinking of yourself as a part of the greater community who's living here on this planet. And especially now with the, with the breakdown environmentally that's going on, it's more important than ever before that we think, our, think of ourselves as, as part of a community and that we need to be a part of the solution, you know, not the problem going forward and resolving the conflicts in our own life and feeding into the resolution of conflicts by using our our coherent consciousness about the targeted monthly practice and sending it out there. These are ways that we can do that. So maybe we should talk about a couple of ideas for specific practices for resolving conflicts. Steve, do you have any ideas about that? Yes, I, yes, I have some ideas. And I, first I want to respond to something that you just said, because it's so important. And that is the recognition that our bodies are communities of 50 trillion cells or so and they all get along. You know, uh, the heart, the, it, all the organs cooperate. And when we look at how our human society is working, where there's so much needless conflict, uh, where healthy cells are, are vying against other healthy cells, it's kind of like autoimmune dysfunction, right? We have, uh, our, our society has autoimmune disease. So part of the way that we heal this autoimmune disease is that we begin to take responsibility ourselves for the conflicts that we're in and things we can actually do something about. So this month, here's a practice. Make a list of those relationships where a conflict has created dissonance. And then one by one, if you can, reach out to those individuals with a call to unite around the heart, even if the beliefs in the mind divide you. Again, if it's somebody who's no, not available, you can still do a forgiveness process and then hold open the space of unity in love without uniformity of belief. We can, we can uh, disagree about certain things, but we can agree that we love each other in the heart. Equally important, notice where you're in conflict with yourself. This might be even more important. Is there an incongruence between what you believe in your heart and how you have acted? Bring yourself into harmony in this month of March and help resolve those conflicts. You know, what you've just said, Steve, uh, reminds me of a great closing to this Resolve Conflicts episode that we're asking our peer participants to involve themselves in for the month of March by resolving conflicts. It's a quote that's actually on the front of my book and it's a quote by Tim Shriver. He says, Uniters do not expect uniformity of opinion, but do seek unity in treating others with dignity, which gives justice a chance to flourish. I think that's a nice close to this episode, Steve. 
and I wish everybody happy resolving conflicts during the month of March.